So a, uh, a very warm uh, welcome uh, to all of you. Uh, I see it's a, f it's a full house, so uh, welcome to the London School of Economics and uh, Political Science for this very special uh, public event hosted by the LSE's European uh, Institute. My name is Eric Neumeyer, as you can uh, tell from both my accent and the name, I'm German as well. Uh, I'm currently the interim president and vice chancellor of the LSE. It is my uh, distinct pleasure to welcome Christian Lindner uh, to the LSE. We have many distinguished guests coming to the LSE, but of course, he is a very special one. He has served as Germany's federal minister of finance uh, since his Free Democratic Party entered government in 2021 in coalition, not always a happy coalition, but a coalition I don't know what you mean. With, the social, <laughs> with the Social Democratic Party and the Green Party. Um, in this capacity, he has policy authority over matters of budget, tax, and fiscal policy, which obviously affect a wide range of issues. Um, Mr. Linton was elected leader of the FDP, as we call it in German, in December 2013. Uh, so he has already been for a long time and has enjoyed a career on both the federal and state levels mm -hmm. since his first election to the state parliament of Nordrhein-Westfalen at the age of 21, is that yes, right? Yeah. That's really uh, young. Um, I should point out uh, one of our former directors, as they were yeah. called back then, now we call him President Ralf Dahendorf, is of course also a uh, German liberal. Uh, a wonderful uh, director of the LSE, by the way. We hold him very, very dear in our memory. Mr. Linder studied political science, philosophy, and public law at the Rheinische Friedrich Wilhelms Universität in Bonn. Before entering politics, he owned an advertising agency and was co-founder of an IT business. And he still serves as a major in the German Air Force Reserves. We will begin with the minister's lecture on empowering no. the economy, followed by a conversation between the two of us, mm -hmm. and then we will open it up for mm -hmm. question and answers. Uh, we will take both questions from the floor, but we mm -hmm. also have an, or, an online audience, so we will try and get uh, both uh, online and in person mm -hmm. in. Do we have a microphone? Would you prefer yes, to? Yes, please. Can we have a microphone in the hand? So, mm -hmm. with no more ado, please uh, join me. In a warm welcome. <laughs> to us. So, thank you very much, uh, Professor Neumeyer. I have to start um, um, by uh, disappointing you. Um, I won't deliver a speech and I won't give a lecture because I prefer to exchange uh, views with uh, you all. So good afternoon. Um, it's really a pleasure for me uh, to uh, be here again because as you have mentioned, uh, Professor Neumeyer, um, the London School of Economics is not only one of the most international universities um, uh, globally, but uh, a former director um, has been um, not only been a member of German Bundestag and my party. Ralf Dahrendorf is one of, I think, the uh, most influential liberal thinkers of the last uh, century, and I really admire his philosophy. He, is a, he has been a strong supporter of uh, social market economy on the one hand and societal liberties. And uh, he um, uh, was advocating for thinking both concepts together, um, a free market society and an open-minded, tolerant society, which we have uh, to remember and um, which we have to remind others of that both concepts are um, interconnected. Thank you for your uh, kind words of introduction. Um, yes, actually I'm the uh, longest serving party leader in Germany. So you witness the Methusalem of German politics here. I managed to survive about a decade and well, um, I'm a very experienced finance minister 
at least compared to my British colleagues. Yeah. Um, <laughs> when I will meet Jeremy Hunt this evening, I probably will uh, play a little uh, a joke to him, telling him, well, as I said to all your four predecessors, <laughs> um, but he knows it's um, just me uh, kidding. Um, I want to, to make three short um, remarks uh, before we can start our conversation. The first, I remember very well when um, I was studying, when I were elected for the first time for the um, state parliament of uh, North Rhine-Westphalia. Um, those days we thought we um, were witnessing the, the end of history. So um, a decade, an era of prosperity, ongoing progress uh, with regard to the um, uh, democracy and the democratic development all over the world. And um, I, pub I, I published a book with the uh, former German foreign minister, Hans-Dietrich Genscher. And um, I told as um, a young man to this very experienced um, former foreign minister, Mr. Genscher, um, we have to change the narrative for the European unification process. Uh, you cannot tell young people about war on European soil. You have to convince them for the European project by telling them the advantages, for example, of Erasmus and the single market. How wrong was I? Today, here in the United Kingdom, there is no Erasmus uh, anymore. And um, on um, a much more serious note, we have war on European soil. For the first time after the Second World War, Russia uh, tries to change political borders by military um, uh, violence, by a war of aggression. And um, what I'm trying to tell you is that um, a peace and um, a freedom are not a heritage we own. We have to work for it in every generation. And um, now we are in a situation of uh, geopolitical uh, tension. Um, we see the seek for global dominance by the People's Republic uh, of China. And in the same moment of time, the United Kingdom decided to leave the European Union. And um, I think the geopolitical tension and this shock after the Russian attack on Ukraine should lead to more cooperation among the liberal democracies of the world. There is a competition of um, uh, systems. Um, there uh, is a threat for the international rule-based order and the idea of multilateralism. And our response has to cooperate more closely and to um, foster um, the international institutions, the multilateral international institutions and the uh, rule-based order. And this is why we are supporting uh, Ukraine in uh, its uh, fight uh, for their right um, of uh, self-determination because they are defending our values and the, the order for freedom and peace in Europe as a whole. It's not only because of uh, humanitarian ideas and solidarity with the people of Ukraine, it's in our best interest to support them because they are fighting for our values and our future. My uh, second um, remark, mm, um, the situation, the economic situation in the United Kingdom and in Germany is um, similar 
or at least comparable for different reasons. I think here in the uh, United Kingdom, we have uh, um, problems caused by the Brexit. And um, in Germany, we have um, a similar situation, not caused by the Brexit, but because of, well, the uh, uh, fast um, um, uh, rising uh, interest rates, because of less demand from the global market, and especially because of our energy infrastructure. Uh, as you probably know, know we have been uh, very dependent on uh, cheap fossil energy imports from Russia. So um, I think both economies are quite strong. And uh, we have our uh, competitive advantages. But for different reasons, both economies uh, are now in the downturn. And um, to, to put it in other words, some say Germany is a sick man again. The German economy is the sick man of Europe again. Um, I don't think so. We have uh, potential. And um, there is uh, a strong opportunity for a quite fast economic recovery and uh, a turnaround. We are not the sick men. We are uh, unfit men. <laughs> and there's a difference, a lack of fitness and a lack of health. We are healthy, we have substance, but we are not in the best shape. Because um, our structural deficits um, had been covered by the low interest rates, by the demand from the world market, by cheap energy uh, imports. And now, uh, since uh, this coverage uh, is gone, we have to focus our, our structural problems. And uh, this leads to uh, supply-side uh, policy reforms. First, in the labor market, we need more flexibility and more qualified immigration into our labor market. Second, we have too much red tape. It takes too long to um, approve and permit um, any private or public sector project. Think about this airport in Berlin. It took two decades to bring it um, uh, operate. And um, I think we can do much better. Um, third, um, we have to improve our public um, uh, infrastructure. And we are doing so, investing um, on an all-time high in um, uh, transportation infrastructure and in uh, grids, digital grids, um, energy uh, grids. Grids. Uh, we need to mobilize uh, private capital. Um, I will come back later on this um, uh, topic, but uh, the, the um, uh, competition problem between the United States and America and European Union or Germany is not a lack of public sector investment. It's private sector investments uh, which we need. So um, I'm uh, really uh, making efforts for further progress on a capital markets union in uh, the European Union. We need a single market for the private sector uh, capital. And of course, uh, we have to consider um, uh, tax reliefs, uh, especially the German corporate tax is now much too high, given the fact that we have shortages on the labor market, that we have um, these uh, problems with the bureaucratic burden for SMEs that we have uh, less private sector funding. So um, the price to operate businesses in Germany is too high given the other competitive uh, disadvantages and uh, structural reform needs um, uh, we have. But if we, we uh, uh, make efforts to overcome this structural deficit, I'm sure there will be very soon uh, a turnaround for the uh, strong German economy. The only um, challenge is to 
convince all players in the political landscape of Germany um, that we have to make these structural reforms and that we mustn't wait um, any longer. And my third and uh, last remark is connected with the second one. Um, for some years, there are two paradigms, that paradigms when it comes to the, the economic development and policies. Um, one is the paradigm uh, which stands behind the Inflation Reduction Act of the United States of America. Um, briefly said, um, we are paying subsidies by governments for certain technologies, sectors, and companies. And we accept a higher uh, debt to GDP ratio in our uh, state's uh, budgets. Um, I doubt that this policy is sustainable, even for the United States of America, given the fact that they are uh, pa paying um, high interest rates and that um, almost the complete federal uh, budget will be dominated by servicing old debt in, in the next, next years. But it's not only a fiscal argument. Um, coming back to Ralf Dahrendorf, um, who promoted social market economy, it's not only that we meet our uh, fiscal limits um, to enter subsidy uh, races. I think it's a problem of knowledge. Because in this paradigm, politicians and uh, public authorities have to make, yeah, let's say, investment decisions. They have to make choices between technologies. They have to decide which sector and which company should be successful by paying subsidies then. And the other concept is improving the, the uh, framework conditions for all technologies, all sectors, all companies, so that a fair competition among technologies, sectors, and companies will establish the future structure of an economy. And of course, as liberal, I'm convinced this is much more sustainable and will lead to, to um, a more competitive um, economic structure in the uh, global surrounding. Because it is not likely that any of uh, our economies is capable of paying subsidies, can afford to pay subsidies for a very long time. So it's only possible well, to foster innovation or to introduce some of new technologies, but in the long term, it's not possible. And so it's not only a fiscal argument, I think it is even an argument of mobilizing knowledge in society. Because if you are under pressure by your competitors, you will invent better solutions and you will be more cost efficient. And so this is why I'm advocating for social market economy because it's in our best interest to mobilize people's ideas and to thrust people that they are capable of finding the best ideas for our future. And this is why I like to be here to uh, be in this uh, atmosphere um, of uh, Ralf Dahrendorf and an open-minded society. So thank you very much for having me and really looking forward to discussing with you all. So let me, let me just open with a few questions and we open it up to the floor. So what you said about uh, the subsidies is really interesting. Um, at the LSE, I teach environmental economics uh, in the summer school, and I always warn my students, you think, uh, you know, subsidies for pollution control, for pollution abatement is a good idea. However, keep in mind subsidies, I always like to say subsidies are a little bit like malaria. Mm. Once you have it, 
Yeah, it's can't very, stop it. it's very yeah. difficult to get uh, rid of it. So that, I think that's a really uh, astute observation. And there are better concepts. For example, um, um, the emission trading systems um, or the perspective of a global uh, carbon market is much more cost efficient and leads to better results, even uh, with regard to uh, climate change mitigation. Exactly so. Set the framework for companies, uh, make it clear to them what the yeah. price is, and then let them figure out yeah. Yeah. how to find the best yeah. solution. And uh, think about the global perspective on this. It is um, very costly in Germany um, to avoid further carbon dioxide because we are a quite efficient uh, industrial society. So the billions we have to spend for the last percentage of being more efficient, what could we finance with uh, this money, for example, in Latin America, Africa, or Asia? So in a global perspective, a carbon market in, in which some less technology-wise, less developed countries could participate uh, um, from our technology in the global perspective for um, climate change mitigation is not only more cost efficient, it is even um, likely to have better results uh, to reduce carbon dioxide. And this is why um, I'm, I'm um, suggesting uh, these ideas to my colleagues, um, for example, in the um, International Monetary Fund. And I think there's a bit of a shift of ideas because due to the problem of indebtedness and high debt to GDP ratios, many low income countries and development countries, they, they feel, okay, we need a new approach. It's not only possible to pay subsidies, but we need to um, uh, foster uh, green uh, development by other means, market driven means. Yeah. If I could change focus a little bit, you mentioned the war in Ukraine. Now, uh, I, th I think it is fair to say that something of a fatigue seems to be setting in from uh, in West, certainly in the Western public, in certain uh, uh, politicians. You just look at the United States, and I'm not even talking about the somewhat scary prospect of yeah. a second Trump presidency, but it's very clear that a good part of the Republican Party essentially wants to get out of um, supporting Ukraine. H how do you see that difficult situation developing? Has the West already lost the war in, in Ukraine? No. Um, we have to support um, Ukraine, um, as I uh, mentioned, because, because it's in our best interest. And uh, if uh, uh, Putin um, succeeded, um, I, I um, uh, wonder who's next and who feels invited globally um, to make attempts to change political borders by um, military uh, violence. And so I think it's in our best interest. Um, I'm not sure what is the, the uh, domestic development uh, in the United States. Um, I know that um, on the one hand the Democratic uh, Party and uh, many of the Republicans I know share this perspective. And um, uh, even though I know the, the latest uh, quote from uh, Trump uh, with regards to uh, Europe's security, I know many uh, Republican politicians uh, who are responsible and uh, who stick to the transatlantic uh, partnership. Now it's the time of campaign. What will happen, we will, we will see. But I um, hope that the United States, they will uh, take their uh, responsibilities and we have to remind them of their uh, responsibilities. <coughs> Having said this, um, first, um, Europe has to do uh, its uh, homework. Um, we will only be attractive for the United States in this century um, 
uh, if we manage to uh, be, uh, again, a prosperous um, economy and um, if we are able to foster our um, security capabilities. So only on eye level we are interesting for them. Otherwise, Europe will become, will become a flyover uh, area. Um, so business will take place in Asia and China on the one hand, and on the other hand um, in the United States and uh, North America. And we will be a flyover region, and uh, no one is interested in us, and we uh, will lose all um, our um, possibilities to influence uh, global policies. And um, you mentioned this fatigue. I think there's, there are strong arguments to convince people why we should uh, further support uh, Ukraine. Um, and if one is not willing to see the strategic perspective, we have to make the people familiar with the consequences, not only for a peace and freedom across Europe. If Putin wins this war, there will be a new wave of refugees in, in Europe with all the um, social and economic uh, costs for societies and all this uh, dramatic and um, um, uh, uh, this is, uh, personal uh, tragedies uh, of millions of people. And I think, so it's um, not only our humanitarian um, motivation, but in our best interest to further support Ukraine. And uh, we will have to make further efforts as European Union, um, including our friends from the United Kingdom. Interesting. So clearly no fatigue there from your side. Um, and there is, of course, always a need to argue. Mm -hmm. And so it's um, in political leadership, it's our responsibility to remind the people of the consequences. The, the war won't stop, Putin won't stop unless we stop him. If I could, um, if you indulge me, uh, if I can ask you another sort of foreign policy question. Obviously, it's not your remit, but you're an important member of the, uh, of the federal uh, uh, German government. Um, the war in Israel-Palestine. Um, um, there's a lot of, there's a lot of uh, controversy amongst German politicians, but basically one thing is uncontroversial, which is Staatsraison uh, to support um, at least the certainly defend the, yeah. uh, the the right of the state of Israel um, to exist, but of course it, you see these pictures. It is a difficult yeah. situation um, to be in, and you know I think we all find this really, it, you know, for us as Germans, yeah. this really gets to the heart of our historical responsibility, and it's. A, it's a difficult situation. Yeah. I wonder whether you can tell us a little bit your sort of reflections on mm. how you see the conflict developing, how you see the role of the German government mm. in this conflict. Mm. Well, we have a very special responsibility for the state of Israel um, because of um, our German history, but not only because of our um, historical responsibility. Uh, Israel is the only democracy in that region which shares our liberal values. And so we show solidarity not only because of our history, but because we share the same values. Um, we need to keep a clear stance um, against terrorism. And we need to call terrorism what has been terrorism. And all these attacks, attacks by Hamas um, were terror. So um, we support the uh, rights of uh, the state of Israel for um, defending uh, itself. But, second remark, um, this right uh, to defend itself is um, 
has limits as far as uh, civilian losses are concerned. And uh, so we uh, need uh, more respect and we ask the um, Israeli uh, government for more respect for uh, humanitarian uh, aid for people in uh, Gaza, for example. I think this is um, necessary to keep uh, support uh, for the uh, right of um, self-defense. Um, and third, it is very difficult right now, but hopefully there will be a situation in the future in which we can consider uh, concepts like this. We are supporting a two-state solution. A two-state solution. There is the right um, of existence for the state of Israel, and there is a need for a state for the Palestinian people. And so I know at the moment we cannot even think about this, but we have to work in that direction so that there can be um, stability and then peace and probably someday prosperity in that region. So rather than me asking more questions, let me open it up because I'm sure there are plenty of uh, of our Sweet. attendees Four, who would, yeah, five, I cannot take uh, six, everyone. Eight, nine, <laughs> ten, eleven, so, twelve. <laughs> okay. Let's start with the channel here. There's, uh, do we have microphones uh, uh, first here? And then we take the lady all the way in the back so as not to penalize yeah. being sitting in the in Could the back. you briefly introduce yourself to me, please? Yes, uh, thank you very much, Mr. Lindner, for the uh, talk. My you are German? You. Yes, I'm okay. German. <laughs> <laughs> Um, uh, I'm a student here at the European Institute and um, I wanted to ask you on one question that is also in mind currently of many politicians in Brussels um, regarding the EU Mercosur free trade agreement. I believe we need free trade right now with um, many markets breaking away with protectionism rising worldwide but on the other hand we have seen um, the difficulties that farmers have protesting not only in Germany but also across Europe. And therefore I wanted to ask you about your st stances on this agreement and also the stances of the German government. To what extent do you believe that a closure of this agreement is still possible? Thank you very much. Do you want to take several? Or no, you no. Uh, I try to, to sure. uh, reply uh, briefly. Mm, we need more free trade agreements. Um, I think uh, they are in our best interest. Of course, there are some uh, concerns, um, especially in France, um, because of uh, um, the situation uh, of their farmers. Mm, I don't know if you are familiar with the domestic German uh, politics. There has been some, some um, events um, with regard to abolishing subsidies for uh, the German agricultural sector. And so um, there is a bit of a protest in, in Germany uh, as well. But uh, why I'm telling this, I think um, we, we won't be able um, to, to maintain the competitiveness of the agricultural sector uh, in Europe by paying subsidies. And so we have to consider um, in this sector in which way can we support a gain of competitiveness there? Again, less bureaucratic burden, um, more innovation to be more efficient, um, and this could, could bring productivity back uh, to um, these uh, farmers and to the complete agricultural sector. It's only possible by being more productive and more innovative than our international competitors. And so we, we need to cooperate uh, more closely with uh, other regions of the world. This is part of uh, our strategy of de-risking from China. Um, we should not decouple from China, but we should de-risk our economies. And the best means to to de-risk is making other regions of the world 
more important for us by reducing the obstacles to enter foreign markets by free trade agreements. And so uh, we are supportive. Okay. I think the European Common Agricultural Policy subsidies are a good example of my it's like malaria. Once yeah. you have it, yeah. it's very, very difficult yeah. to get rid of. Let's have the lady all the way in the back. If you could please wait for the microphone, stand up. Please say your name and who you are. Good evening. My name is Leonarda. I'm studying uh, international history. Und ich bin Deutsch, in case that was important. Um, I would like to touch on what you just mentioned, the de-risking, not decoupling, German policy towards China. Is there a long-term strategy um, for the German economy vis-a-vis -vis China since Xi Jinping has announced that he, the People's Liberation Army will be ready to invade Taiwan by 27 and will for sure do it by 2030? So if Taiwan is going to be the next Ukraine, what is the long-term strategy of the German economy? This is a very difficult uh, question to answer in uh, presence um, of representatives uh, of German media. <laughs> because uh, as a member of a government, I should not speculate on further geopolitical tension. This is why what I'm now going to say has nothing to do with further geopolitical tension. Uh, we need to be more resilient. Um, our supply chains have to be more resilient. And this is why the German government has made a very, for me, difficult decision. Um, we are supporting some semiconductor um, uh, manufacturers to be located uh, in Germany because we need chips, cutting edge chips for the next generation um, of uh, German goods from from um, uh, 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 cars uh, to um, a complete uh, energy um, systems. We need cutting edge chips. Now, um, we are supplied by the global market and we have no production capacity um, in Europe and um, especially not uh, in Germany. And so, unfortunately, we had to enter the global subsidy race in this uh, semiconductor uh, surrounding uh, to support uh, the decisions, for example, um, of Intel to build a plant in um, Magdeburg. Um, and this is part of our strategy to be uh, less threatened by uh, any geopolitical tension. Next question. Gentleman here, yeah. And then you, please. Thanks. Um, my name is Daniel. I study econ at the University of Mannheim and LSE. Um, my question is if Mannheim. I'm. Mannheim, yes. Mannheim, um, currently doing a study abroad program here. Um, when I'm currently looking on the um, current surveys in Germany, then I see that the FDP is under 5% in some surveys. So I want to ask you, in which way do you think that you can solve these problems and convince more voters for the FDP for the next um, vote election? Well, um, the, the uh, account polls cannot reflect the circumstances under which the next general election in Germany will take place. So the political surrounding, the perspective for the next legislature is completely unknown right now. And so these polls are mm, a call for action, to put it this way, but they do not reflect really, cannot reflect the situation when the next general election uh, will take place. I take these polls uh, very seriously and one a uh, consequence is that we have to solve uh, people's uh, problems. Uh, we have uh, been making efforts to um, change the migration uh, policies in Germany. I think very successful. Um, we have to bring Germany back on track in uh, um, uh, the economy. We, um, the people expect government 
uh, to bring uh, growth back. This improves the uh, personal perspectives of um, uh, people of the middle class. And so this is one of the priorities and has to be one of the priorities um, of the German uh, government. And um, bringing Germany back on track will bring the Liberal Party back on track. Um, there's nothing which is good for my party, which is not in the same sense good for the further development of uh, our society. And um, um, in uh, that sense, I'm working very hard in the government for improving the economic situation of our country. Hello, thank you. Jule Sommer, also from Germany, studying here as a master's student. My question is about the European project kind of idea. In the recent days, we've seen again the FDP kind of backstabbing uh, the other parties in the government on the, with the supply chain, chain law. But I would like to ask you, are you aware of the damaging effect that has for the German reputation on the EU level? And please do not comment on the specific law because we're all aware that procedures take many, many weeks where you could have interjected and asked something. So are you aware and what are you doing to trying to heal that? Yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, this is a wrong narrative. This is a wrong narrative. No one uh, could have been surprised by the decision the German government has made. We have uh, clearly described under which conditions the German government could accept a corporate sustainability, sustainability due diligence directive. We have it described clearly in our coalition agreement in December 2021, and then again um, in November of last year. But the consensus uh, among the co-legislatures um, is uh, far beyond the red lines of the German government, and so no one can be surprised that we have to abstain then. Do you expect the French to read the coalition? Pardon? Hmm? Do you expect the French to read the coalition agreement? No, but um, council conclusions and the positioning of the German government in the council. Okay, Danny. Uh, can, we, can we have the microphone here? Danny will read out one or two questions from our audience online. Minister, you have repeatedly emphasized the dire need for investment into a structural transition of the German economy that very obviously require at least some public investment. Yet you and your party strongly oppose both raising public spending and raising tax. How can these contradictory positions be reconciled? Well, by making decisions in the budget. Uh, we are investing on um, a record level. In, 2020, um, in 2019, um, the investment uh, ratio in the federal public uh, budget has been 11%, and now it's 12.3%. Uh, so it's rising. And uh, then we have the Climate and Transition Fund with a further public sector investment. And there is clearly a limit. If you invest more with uh, public money um, in a situation of limited uh, capacities in the economy, this will only lead to higher prices and a crowding out effect of private uh, projects uh, which uh, could probably be replaced by public sector projects. So um, we are investing um, on almost an all-time high, probably in the years after the German unification, beginning of the 90s, a bit more, but now it, I think it's an all-time high, at least compared to the last uh, 15 uh, years. Our problem is the lack of private sector uh, investment. And this is why um, um, I, I, uh, I'm working for improving the um, uh, conditions there. I've mentioned supply-side policies, labor market, bureaucracy, taxation, 
and um, Capital Markets Union, and that probably I should, should add that um, our pension system uh, in Germany is really a problem in this regard. They are uh, at the moment investing in mortgages in wherever and uh, not in interesting companies or infrastructure in Germany, and uh, so we can change this uh, as well. Okay, Danny, do you have another interesting sure. question from online? If not... Uh, German politics has become more fragmented over time, with votes and seats in the Bundestag going to a wider number of parties and government formation becoming increasingly difficult, as I think you personally have witnessed. Yeah, um, How has this affected the functioning of the current government coalition, and what do you think this fragmentation might mean for Germany in future? Mm -hmm. We have more diversity in our societies, and this leads to... Um, um, a diversification of the uh, political uh, system. Um, well, in, in 1969, in Germany, there were three parties only, and um, they, um, uh, they decided to build a social liberal um, coalition, for example, and the um, uh, market share of my party had been 5.8% in a three-party system. So the um, situation has changed completely because some, or, or there are, are no longer two uh, catch-all parties, um, uh, Volkspartei uh, in the uh, German terminology. I think the, the Anglo-Saxon uh, terminology is a catch-all party or people's party. And they uh, have no longer the the magnetism uh, to attract um, um, uh, 40 uh, or uh, even more uh, percent of uh, society. So building a government is challenging. Um, more often, um, you need parties from, well, uh, let's call it both camps. So the parties left the center and right the center, the two camps, they have to cooperate and have to, to bring their ideas together. In Germany, we are not really familiar with that concept. Uh, we uh, experienced the, the grand coalitions, and this was a bit a suspension of, of a party competition. But um, the uh, more colorful um, coalitions uh, coming from both camps, this is not um, a stop for the party competition because um, everyone thinks what will be the next coalition. And um, so we are not familiar um, with this uh, concept in Germany, although um, we could benefit from it. We could benefit. At the moment, I don't dare uh, to say that Germany and my party, for example, benefits uh, from it, but it could because we are negotiating uh, conflicts of societies and uh, conflicts of interests in economy among coalition partners. And um, the result is usually a very good consensus. The only problem is the process the process is so difficult and harms the, the project itself so seriously that in the end, even good legislature is recognized by the people as, well, a mistake um, or, or as, as um, at least no success. And um, we have to um, uh, improve the communication um, of uh, the consensus we found in, in our coalition. Given the fact that all are in, in competition, this is uh, normal in the political system, but um, since we have a result, we should defend it together. Okay, let's go back to the audience in the room. Can I have the lady here, please? Can we have a microphone? There. <laughs> Thank you. 
Thank you. Hello, uh, my name is Miram Nolden, and I study international development and humanitarian emergencies. And I'm wondering if we talk about empowering the economy, how can we restructure the economy that not only people benefiting from uh, generational wealth can benefit from a strong economy, but also people that are systematically disadvantaged and therefore belong to uh, a lower socioeconomic class. So single moms, disabled people, yeah. immigrants from low and middle income countries. Thank you. Um, thank you very much. I think it's a very important question because liberal democracies have to deliver on this um, to maintain uh, their stability. And I think my, well, my concept is um, we have to invest in education. Education is the key that uh, people are, are uh, capable um, of, of um, leading uh, their lives the way they want. And uh, you mentioned um, a second a challenge. Um, people should uh, be able to make choices for their biographies. And um, in Germany, in many regions, for example, we have a lack of uh, early childhood uh, care and education. And this means that for example, single moms, they don't have the, the um, uh, opportunity to make choices, but they have to care for their children because there is no, no uh, public um, offering uh, so that they can make a choice whether they stay at home or how long they stay at home or return or enter, enter their job life. On the international level, I think free trade is uh, one instrument to uh, global um, uh, labor diversification. Um, and so it is uh, a means to allow low-income countries to develop. In the, given, in the current situation, especially for the, the um, least developed uh, countries and low-income countries, we have to um, solve the uh, problem of indebtedness which uh, harms their development perspectives. And this, as finance minister, is uh, one of um, my challenges to um, have a common framework for the debt treatment of those uh, countries. So uh, given the um, higher interest rates, they can develop their economy and are not, not threatened by their public debt. OK, I think we have uh, room for maybe two more questions. Let's. Take the gentleman here and then all the way in the back to the left there. And I apologize for everyone else who didn't manage to ask a question. Yeah, hi. Um, good evening. My name is Johannes. I also um, study here in, uh, in the Masters at the LSE. My question is very much related to empowering the economy um, and um, migration. So the German newspaper Welt published uh, an article the other day saying that Migration is not uh, at the very top of the agenda of British voters anymore, which it used to British be. British voters. British voters, yes. But it still is for German voters. So my question is, what can German politics learn in terms of uh, migration from Britain? Maybe you can also comment on the specific uh, Rwanda idea. Mm -hmm. So um, um, the uh, Rwanda approach, um, I doubt that it is uh, possible in German legally, politically, uh, that it's possible uh, in the European Union that it is compliant with uh, uh, any idea of uh, humanitarian uh, rights. So um, I have um, said too much as a guest in the United Kingdom and member, and member of the German government. So um, um, you, you understand what I'm uh, trying to say. So, um, concentrating on Germany, we have um, um, a mixed answer. On the one, one hand, we need a qualified workforce, and we have to invite people coming to Germany to participate in our labor market. And we are uh, much less attractive than uh, many think in Germany domestically. We are much less attractive because of well, early childhood, early childhood uh, education and uh, the um, lack of capacities. Our education system as a whole 
is, um, well, a, a cause of uh, concern. Um, high taxes, high uh, social contributions for uh, qualified uh, people, and then the German language, which is an obstacle for qualified people across the world. And so we are less attractive, and we have to make efforts to be attractive uh, for the people, um, the qualified people we need. So this is the first answer. Um, actually, we um, have presented a new legislation, which will make it much easier um, to, to hire people uh, into the German uh, labor market. It's a bit comparable with the uh, Canadian uh, system. And on the other hand, we have to, to um, maintain control who is coming to Germany. So we have um, social responsibilities. We, are, um, we show solidarity with uh, people uh, who uh, need um, our uh, protection. But frankly, there has been illegal immigration into our welfare system. And without control, every public order and every social security system uh, will have enormous problems without control of, uh, of access. And so we have restored the, the order, the control of access to Germany, to our welfare system, to our labor market. And it's really an ambitious package um, we have made uh, decisions uh, on. And this is one of the um, successes I've mentioned, the success of uh, this specific coalition with two left-wing parties, excuse me, colleague Becker, uh, two left-wing parties and one one um, um, uh, centristic liberal party. It's really, really, um, really a success. And um, uh, it was not possible um, in the era of Mrs. Merkel and a government led by, by the Conservative Party. So really a success, but frankly, no one in Germany has recognized this shift in our migration, migration policy. And it's a pity, because people will be uh, benefiting from this. So I think I need to apologize to the gentleman. No, 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 fact, no, no, we no, we yes. Have the time? Jeremy has to wait a minute. Jeremy has to wait, so he's beating the <laughs> Chancellor of the Exchequer, apparently in a pub uh, uh, later on. But we will take then the last question there in the very end. Yes, please. Thank you very much indeed also for this. Um, um, my name is Antonio Loguera. I'm from the Italian newspaper La, La Repubblica. Okay, now I, it's now it's on the Stability and Growth Pact, I suppose. Uh, yeah, I mean uh, <laughs> partially. Uh, the first part of the question is you 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 you, 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 you mentioned okay you mentioned the uh, need of uh, co cooperation in uh, uh, Europe. So how do do you regard this um, possible new wave of right wing at the next? Uh, a uh, European uh, uh, election and how Europe can be united because we have like the, the Italian government there, you have, have had uh, um, uh, conflicts on that, on the ESM, on the stability pact. So what's the, fu the, the future of, uh, uh, of uh, uh, Europe in this regard? Thank you. Thank you. Well, um, the European election is still coming and um, uh, we have to make efforts that um, we um, uh, maintain stability and um, um, a constructive uh, majority in the new European uh, Parliament. And um, everyone uh, should ask uh, her or himself, what can I do to take part uh, in this effort? You all, if you are coming from Germany, for example, you all have parents, friends, grandparents, relatives, colleagues, and friends. And so uh, make a constructive majority in the, EU Parliament, in the new European Parliament to one of your personal projects. I don't want to make a recommendation which party you should vote for. Um, I had an idea. Uh, <laughs> 
but uh, clearly um, you imagine which parties I warn you to support. And the other question, cooperation, well, there are, of course, uh, conflicts of interest uh, among member states and France. And um, we have to, to build bridges. Um, for example, um, you have mentioned the ESM, and um, at the moment we are negotiating the uh, new fiscal rules. Uh, Germany worked as a bridge builder for the economic governance review. And this is the counter-narrative to the question of uh, Germany as the maverick uh, of the European Union. We were the bridge builder. There had been a Franco-German understanding under which conditions could there be a majority in the European Council for new fiscal rules. And um, my uh, French friend, uh, Bruno Le Maire, he uh, was one of the supporters for more public sector investment and flexibility. And um, as you probably know, I'm a bit more hawkish uh, when it comes to the uh, public uh, finances. And so um, um, uh, I said to the colleagues, okay, the condition for the German support is a reliable path to lower deficits and um, a decline of the debt to GDP ratio. And well, now the new, new fiscal rules are not easier and really not more transparent than the old ones, <laughs> to say the least. Uh, but they combine a bit more flexibility for investment, long-term perspective, adjustments, trajectory periods, well, uh, logopede. Uh, <laughs> uh, and on the other hand, um, um, a, a much more sufficient set of rules to see more uh, sound uh, public finances and sustainability. And this convinced then the Finnish colleague and my uh, Italian friend and colleague, and we found a consensus, which um, luckily um, the trilogue between uh, Parliament, Commission, and um, uh, Council um, continues this um, consensus. So it's my, my first assessment. So we need to negotiate and to, to stay in close contact. Then we can solve problems. Okay, so I have uh, two requests, please. In a moment, uh, the minister and I will leave the stage where you please stay seated. It's, this is for security uh, reasons. But before that, please join me. Sieht aber niemand gefährlich aus. Nein, sieht niemand gefährlich aus, aber es ist Protokoll. Wer ist native speaker uh, German? <laughs> I, I think we could have more or less I'm held it in German. And, and who is not German native speaker? Oh, ah, okay. no, it is a good mix. Hab ich mich hier, ja? Gut, gut, gut geschlagen. So, please uh, join me in a round of applause.